today in my presentation, I want to develop um, the idea of crisis pragmatism, which is understood as a modality that is regulating Europe as, um, as a social space. And I will try to show that this basically modality is becoming predominant, especially through the COVID-19 crisis. Um, the idea of my presentation is to put in, in context what is basically discussed as populism. And I think we can distinguish uh, different um, periods. There was basically, of course, the period of neoliberal agenda in the starting in the 70s, and it's still, which is still on, going on in different uh, European countries. Then it was followed by a, a, by a period of uprising uh, 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 populist movements. Um, I, I, I remember, I, I think my manual focus paper was pretty clear on this point. Um, there was a left-wing uh, critique of neoliberal reform agendas and outputs, but also a right-wing nationalist populist reaction to it. And in the, in the, in the late uh, 2000 years, especially uh, through the Euro crisis, um, crisis pragmatism developed as a kind of post-neoliberalism. And post-neoliberalism simply means it is not non-neoliberalism and it is not yet an alternative to neoliberalism. It is basically um, a, a modality of regulating social, economic and political relations that is basically um, uh, the outcome uh, uh, of, of neoliberalism. And today in my presentation, I want to, to, to argue and to show also with a small empirical example um, that COVID-19 crisis was basically um, uh, the breakthrough of this crisis uh, uh, pragmatism. And uh, I think there are, there are, there are six reasons why um, in today's uh, Europe, uh, neo neoliberalism finally collapsed after COVID-19. First of all, the rise of China as economic partner, technological competitor, and systemic rival. Second, the Brexit populism, um, which was from, the, from a European perspective a shock experience, and it was also changing political majorities in the EU at the expense of German economic liberalism. There was also um, the ambivalent experiences with crisis management since 2009. There is, of course, the climate change as a new challenge um, for, for, for Europe. Um, there is um, a, a permanent trouble with a dysfunctional Maastricht system since the 90s. It was an ongoing transformation of the Maastricht uh, 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 logic until today, where it was finally uh, 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 removed. And, and of course, uh, uh, since the 90s, we, we experienced a, a changing production chains in Europe, and uh, the neoliberal competition state was no longer um, a usable concept in order to govern, to, to control, and to, and to uh, further develop this uh, a new European uh, uh, economy. In my presentation, I will, in the first step, very quickly uh, uh, present my approach. And then I will, I will make a comparative discourse analysis of two EU documents on Italy, so the so-called European semester. Um, then I will discuss the results. And finally, I will present elements of crisis pragmatism. And I will also discuss how this relates to populism. Um, my analytical approach is based on four different levels. First uh, level is the world economy. The second level are institutions, then networks, and finally discourses. The world economy is defined as a geoeconomic structure that regulates unequal distribution of economic, social, and cultural capital between regions and social classes. Institutions, in contrast, are modalities of fixing and routinizing social practices over time in order to reduce contingencies and to fix power relations. Networks are understood as social connection between experts, media, politi politicians, and business people that regulates basically the circulation of ideas. <clears throat> and discourses are um, defined as linguistic and cognitive structure of cultural artifacts, such as texts, also reports, that regulates interpretation processes between actors and institutions. And in my today's presentation, I will only touch three of these levels, and I will analyze in more detail only the discourse level. Um, if you are interested in a detailed um, uh, reading of my, of my discourse analysis, I recommend to you uh, the paper, which is open access and you can easily uh, get it, but I can also send it to you. Um, my uh, discourse analysis is based on two reports, two so-called EU country reports on Italy in that case. The first is 
uh, was, was published um, immediately before the crisis uh, started in February 2020. And the second report, the so-called Council Recommendations, um, was published um, in the mid, in, in, uh, when the crisis officially was accepted as a crisis. Yeah, so the crisis basically appeared in between these two reports, which are part of an institutional structure of the European Union governance system. Um, in my discourse analysis, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will um, elaborate three different, uh, different features. First, discursive temporality. Second, discursive authority. And finally, discursive ethos. And I will um, compare these three different discursive structures um, with the old, the pre-COVID-19 order, uh, represented by the first document, with a new uh, post-COVID-19 order, represented by the second document. What I want to show is basically the, that uh, six different discourse structures um, help people, especially in institutions, um, in national, but also in European institutions, um, to perceive the political economy and to intervene into uh, uh, what is called political economy. Um, let's start with the first um, um, case, the EU country report on Italy from uh, February uh, 2020. So the first, uh, uh, first uh, um, 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 feature is what I call uh, discursive temporality. And with discursive temporality, it is basically a very, very typical feature of every economic expert discourse. The economic temporality or discursive temporality provides people with an apparatus of economic categorization and evaluation. And this economic, uh, uh, this, this, this uh, uh, apparatus of economic categorization and evaluation is organized on a, on a timeline from yesterday, today, and the future, which is very, very typical. The second uh, uh, typical feature for European documents in the, in the, in the era before 2019 are uh, um, two authorities. One is basically GDP, and the other one is debt. And these authorities are always competing authorities. They allow people to speak in the name of a certain, um, of a certain aspect, in that case, GDP or debt, in order to uh, uh, to promote certain concepts, to promote certain uh, reform agendas, or even to, to punish countries, right? And a, a final, a third uh, uh, characteristic of European Union documents are what I, what I would call professional objectivity, which is the ethos of technocracy. Yeah? So these, these, uh, uh, this kind of subjectivity, was, which is represented by the texts, are a modality that allows people, and in that case, the authors, to speak in a certain way, and what we see always is a form of professional a distance, a professional objectivity. So what has changed? And when we look at the second uh, uh, report, the Council Recommendations from um, May uh, uh, 2020, then we see a significant changes. First of all, that is now uh, the, dis the system of discursive temporality is replaced by a logic of crisis de exist. What does it mean? A crisis de exist is basically the de exist is uh, it's a strategy that uh, refers to the point of here and now. And what we see in the documents is always the crisis creates a point of here and now. So the, the system of temporality is more or less in crisis is replaced by, by the idea that the crisis is always here and always here and always here, which is a very interesting feature. Um, second, um, the discursive authority is now uh, represented by kind of a crisis as a master signifier. So uh, even GDP and debts are uh, they move down to the to the system of categories and evaluations, and the only authority that is basically that allows people to evaluate the economic space of Europe is the crisis. The crisis, either the crisis exists or not, and every other um, um, economic category is basically put on one on one line. And the final um, characteristic of uh, of the post uh, uh, COVID nineteen uh, situation in discourses is a, a switch from professional objectivity of the technocrats to um, emotional investments. So, so the, these technocratic discourses, uh, what I would call the hysteria of technocracy, is uh, what we see is a much more emotional evaluations of, of, uh, of, of certain um, aspects of the political economy. So disrupting, threatening, negative, serious, major. These are words which are normally not used by, by technical discourses. So what are the consequences of these uh, uh, strategies? 
Um, so let's go now from step by step from one level to, to another level. We start with the discourse level. And what we see here is basically a, a change in the discourse structures of the way how the economy is seen by um, European institutions. So um, what we learn is basically the way how economic expertise persists the EU economy and the economic policy has changed dramatically. And to, uh, to really related to, to, to populism, I would say there is now no space for populism because the crisis as a kind of external uh, element is, um, is removing all the existing or authorities from the from the first uh, 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 from the from the primary stage of discourse production. But we can also have a look at the second level of institutions. Now there is an additional level uh, um, that I that I add to my analysis. Um, of course, uh, there was a dramatic change also in 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 in, uh, in um, European institutions. So the European semester has was was rearranged completely. But also um, a couple of new institutions uh, emerged. So rescue packages were adopted to the needs of the Corona situation. The so-called kurzarbeitergeld or short-term allowance was established as a global model in all countries, even beyond Europe. And um, there was a big investment fund the first time. Um, in, in, in the EU, EU taxes were introduced, um, transnational economic consciousness appeared, so people became aware that European supply chains exist and not national supply chains. And of course, the role of the ECB as a crisis manager was once again, once again, once again confirmed. And <clears throat> the conclusion is uh, EU economic institutions were further developed and in some uh, and some of them have changed significantly. And I think this is a problematic situation for populism because institutions are uh, able to adopt to new situations. Um, and finally, so what is, what is going on on the level of the European world economy? This is a concept that I, that I use from Fernand Bordel and Wallerstein. Um, What's going on on the level of the world economy? I think this is an uh, interesting thing that uh, uh, the corona crisis led and will lead to basically a deepening, a perpetuation, and intensification of existing structural imbalances within the EU world economy. So we can see it basically um, in terms of, of, of uh, uh, crisis uh, rescue packages. The, strong, the strongest country basically, that in that case, the Germany, the biggest uh, country, but also the economically strongest country, has used the most uh, uh, many, many uh, 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 um, measures, was able to mobilize many measures to manage the crisis. But also in terms of uh, social inequality, low income people um, struggled more with the crisis than middle and high income people. Um, the, the, the crisis, the, the, the world economy is also characterized by, by a, a deepening of existing tendencies. So the Brexit uh, 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 led in combination with uh, uh, Corona, to, to collapse of the, UK, of the UK economy, this is now intensified. Um, even if Brexit uh, was, was, was complicated enough, now that it comes, in addition to that, uh, uh, Corona. Um, the crisis of the North Italian industrial structure is perpetuated. Um, the endless stratification of Central and Eastern European industrial suppliers is solidified. And of course, uh, uh, the Southern European tourism sector, which is very important for many countries in the South of Europe, is in deep crisis. And uh, uh, here are some data that would support uh, these uh, uh, evaluations. And the conclusion is the European world economy has not changed at all. Instead, we observe an intensified past dependency and further splits and fissures among European regions, classes, and sub-economies. And this is very supportive for, for populism. So to conclude, what is basically, what are the elements of uh, uh, crisis pragmatism first? Economic experts speak in the name of crisis as authorization device and take measures that do no longer follow a clear economic theory. This is a very interesting uh, uh, observation, especially with respect to the discussion of uh, neo neoliberalism that always exists and so on. Second, institutions change constantly. There is no institutional past dependency and continuity possible anymore. So institutions are able to adopt to new situations, which is also part of this pragmatism. National societies become disembedded and rearticulated along post-national spaces of inequality. So new forms of inequality emerge next to class, in, class uh, inequalities on the, on the class level. We see um, um, an emerging and intensification of inequality on the level of geography, which is, uh, which is very interesting, especially when we talk about 
European Union is a kind of a quasi state. And the structures of the European world economy constantly creates new crisis events, which opens up spaces for uh, new forms of populism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mays, for a very comprehensive presentation. Uh, I see a couple of virtual hands. Uh, I'll go with Alex Klein first. Uh, no, sorry, that was just applause. That okay. was the applauding hand sign. That was not the I have a question sign. Sorry. All right, I appreciate it. That's uh, virtual hands for the presentation first. Then. Uh, questions, comments, or feedback? Um, yes, I have one question. Um, in your opinion, uh, is the suspension of the Maastricht criteria definitive, or will they uh, be applied in other form uh, with the end of the pandemic? In my view, it is um, the, the, the discourse is when the Corona crisis is over, then we can think about uh, re-establishing re -establishing the old the old Maastricht criteria, the Maastricht criteria of 2019 yeah, in, the, in this form. Um, this is basically the main definition. So when what is needed is somebody to declare the crisis is over. And uh, this is a, I, I, I can't see somebody who would, who would do that. There must be a consensus in Europe on the crisis is over, which I cannot see, even if the crisis is over. Um, and if they declare the crisis is over in five years or 10 years or two years, then uh, there is a big debate among economists um, from, from, different, from different camps of the theoretical and political and ideological uh, uh, views um, that they must be reformed. And uh, they will, they will, the idea is either we uh, remove them at all or we uh, make a reform of uh, the useful, useful concept of uh, Maastricht. And um, yeah, this is what I see. Thank you. Other questions? Comments? So I can just uh, make a quick comment. Uh, I especially was interested in the, the impact on networks uh, as someone uh, does study uh, networks and network governance perspectives. I'm curious in terms of your plans for potential impact and policy solutions. Are you interested in working with others so those are the impact, and some of them are negative impacts. What are some potential solutions? Uh, are you interested in those two, or just you want to identify the yes, issues and others can address potential solutions? This was a comment, yeah? What's that? It, 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 it was difficult for me to understand you because there's a- The, the comment was, so you found some interesting challenges and major issues because of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. uh, my question to you was, are you working with practitioners in the field or policy scholars in the field in answering so what and what is next kind of questions? Yeah, so I'm, 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 I'm looking empirically. I'm doing interviews with economists. Um, we are doing interviews with economists from, from universities, but, but also from think tanks. And uh, uh, there is a constant, uh, constant uh, feedback from the from the field, basically on, on the one hand. But we also plan now a new project on uh, on think tanks of Europe and on Europe, and this will be basically uh, hopefully answer the, the 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 network part, especially when it comes to uh, uh, to 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 discuss well. Are there now uh, expert networks um, on the European level, which would be uh, interesting uh, uh, in order to understand how the European or Europe as a social space is, is stabilized in the future? So I don't see I don't see a crisis. <laughs> I see more, much more stabilization processes going on right now, especially through the crisis, because the crisis allows it's like a shadow. It allows people to create new relations, and while others look to the crisis all the time, and this is basically what is going on in Europe. 